Hello, and welcome to one of our last lectures. We're, we're, getting, we're getting down near the end here. Um, and, and as befitting an end, we're seeing some significant changes. Um, and today we're going to focus on some economic change. We're going to focus on uh, the shift from staple production to industrial production. This is a long-term change. It doesn't happen quickly. Uh, and it doesn't happen quite as simply as I'm going to suggest today, but what I'm going to, to uh, what I'm going to identify today is a pattern uh, that's evident uh, in this time period, and it really won't be seen fully through for 30, 40, 50 years into the future, um, but you can certainly see that it's underway uh, in this time period. And we're also going to we spent most of this course um, we've had a lot of readings from the Maritimes, but in terms of the kind of big narrative of the course responsible government and economic change and expansion, all those things. We've really focused on, on the Canadian colonies, uh, Lower Canada and Upper Canada, uh, much more than the Maritime Colonies. So today we're going to focus on the Maritime Colonies, just to use them as examples uh, of the kind of economic change that we're seeing. Um, very much the same kinds of things are taking place um, in Upper Canada and Lower Canada, uh, but th these are just going to be some maritime examples. But really it's the, it's the type of economic change uh, that we're going to be focusing on. That's the most important lesson for today. We've seen some of the older staple industries in the past. We haven't spent a lot of time on all of them. We've spent a little bit of time on fishing. Uh, we've pointed to timber. We've pointed to agriculture. Um, and those are staple uh, economic activities. Those are staple products. And staples, in the same way that you refer to, you know, flour, sugar, and eggs as kind of staples of the kitchen, they're the, they're the building blocks for making other things. It's the same thing in an economy. Uh, timber, fish, agriculture, these are primary products. They are raw products taken out of nature that we then process in some fashion uh, to, to make something else to, to eat, to build, you know, whatever timber you make, houses and furniture, fish you eat, agriculture, you do lots of things with agriculture. We eat it, obviously, but we do other things with it as well. And we want to see how the, we're going to move into a secondary economy. That's where you're actually doing things with those products. So I want to talk a little bit about that transition uh, here in this time period. The staples we're going to look at are timber, fishery, and agriculture. And I've chosen those three because they're three important uh, products, um, but they also nicely correspond to the three maritime colonies uh, and also highlight uh, kinds of specializations within those colonies. Uh, I think if you were to look at a specialization in Upper Canada and Lower Canada, it would be agriculture. Uh, and that certainly works for Prince Edward Island uh, in the maritime colonies. Uh, and while Nova Scotia and New Brunswick both have agricultural economies, uh, they're overshadowed by the importance of timber and the fishery in those different colonies. So when we look at timber, we'll be kind of looking at New Brunswick. When we look at fisheries, we'll be kind of looking at Nova Scotia. When we look at agriculture, we'll be kind of looking at PEI as well, just to kind of make that point. And I think that's a useful point. We won't spend a lot of time on this particular differentiation, but it's also a useful point for us to keep in our minds because um, I think we often tend to lump the maritime colonies all in together, all being kind of the same. Uh, and in some ways they are. Um, but in some ways they're really quite different. And these economic differences really point to that. Uh, and, and I'll show you a slide uh, later in this lecture that highlights how these different uh, staple products are relatively much more important in the different colonies. So we'll, we'll pick up that later. So these correspond, and you can take a look at this later when you're taking some notes, but to New Brunswick, to Nova Scotia, and PEI. New Brunswick, beginning with New Brunswick, it's, it's often referred to uh, as the timber colony. It really was a significant player in the transatlantic timber uh, trade, uh, and it becomes by far the most important economic engine uh, in New Brunswick in the first half of the 19th century. Much of this stems from an active pursuit of timber, uh, meaning that it's actually forced companies going after timber, especially the big, tall uh, pine trees that, that exist in the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, but also pushing even further beyond that to a general push to obtain as much merchantable timber as possible. And by merchantable timber, we're talking about big trees here. We're talking about trees that can be converted into other things. If you drive through, I don't know, say eastern Ontario or, or, or parts of Quebec and, and New Brunswick today, you'll drive through lots of forest. It's Canada. Um, but the trees may not be particularly impressive. 
uh, that's because they've most of them have been cut sometimes two or three times uh, and so you're looking at fairly young forests not mature forests forests that are being cut uh, in the early 19th century are, are much older um, they're 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 at a much later stage of development and many of them contain very large trees some of them are really quite impressive 100 foot tall pine trees that are three four or five feet wide at the base hemlock trees are even bigger uh, really quite massive things and that's really what they're targeting here the thing that we need to keep in our mind here is that these this this industry is cutting down trees a lot of the trees, most famously, some of these big pine trees, for example, are being used at, used as masts uh, by the Royal Navy, because uh, the Royal Navy is you know, part of the, part of what supports British power around the world. Actually, a large part of what supports British power around the world. So masts for those naval vessels are very, very important, very valuable. So they're being shipped back to England for that purpose and building ships for the Royal Navy. Um, but a lot of the timber is just being shipped back in general for timber purposes back in Britain. Britain doesn't have well, doesn't have hardly any uh, uncut forest left, uh, and certainly during war times, and there, as you know, as we've seen in this course, they're at war with France a lot. They'll be at war with Russia and uh, in Germany in the next century. Uh, so access to timber was really very important, and uh, the eastern colonies of, of uh, North America, New Brunswick and Quebec and Ontario in particular, provided a lot of that timber. So very valuable products. But what what you need to keep in mind is that New Brunswick is just shipping back raw timber. Um, there's not a whole lot of things being done to that timber, they're not making it into something else. We'll, we'll see in a few minutes that, the, that they are, and that that's increasing over time. Uh, and that's why I say this, 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 this thing of this notion of a, a transition from staple to industrial is slightly overdrawn. I'm, I'm trying to show you a pattern more than a kind of simple reality. Um, but cer so certainly there's some things happening. People are building houses, for example, out of, out of New Brunswick trees in New Brunswick. That's, that's obvious. Uh, but you don't see, for example, like a furniture industry or, or even much of a shipbuilding industry. We're going to see one, and we're going to get to that later in the course. Uh, well, sorry, later in the lecture. Uh, but not that much going on right here. So most of the raw product is being shipped overseas. And, of course, that means that it's being um, manufactured into more, more valuable things. They're making a ship. A ship is much more valuable than wood. They're making furniture. Furniture is much more valuable than wood. They're making valuable things out of these things. They're adding, in, in an economist's term, they're adding value. We talk about value-added products. It means that you're adding value to the raw material. That's why we call them staples. They're, you make something else out of them, and those things are more valuable. So much of the wealth being accrued, there's wealth being accrued in New Brunswick. Don't, don't misunderstand this. But more wealth is accruing uh, back in Britain. There's more value being added there. Uh, and that's kind of part of that classic colonial relationship. New Brunswick has some advantages in the trade. Lots of cheap labor, most of it provided by settlers. Um, New Brunswick is slightly behind Nova Scotia uh, in terms of the settlement pattern. They tend to be getting poorer settlers, and those poorer settlers therefore need to work. Uh, and because there's lots of them, that means that the price of labor is down, uh, and there, there's lots of trees available to be cut, and a market for those trees. So cheap labor uh, in cutting those trees. High wartime prices. This will diminish over the course of the 19th century, uh, but it, um, particularly during the Napoleonic Wars in the late 18th and early 19th century, up to the end of the war, <coughs> excuse me, up to the end of war, war of 1812, prices are very, very high. There's great demand for this timber, um, because in part, in part, because the war means they're cut off from continental Europe, from Scandinavian and German timber. Uh, so suddenly, the North American timber is even more valuable and drives the price up. And there's also this thing called colonial preferences. And this is a bit complex, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but it's the simple issue is that when products are shipped into, uh, into most any country, but in, in our case into, into England, um, there's usually a tariff placed on that product, a, a, a tax, if you will, on the product entering a port. And it's a way of, of both raising revenue for the government, uh, but also of regulating trade. And what the British government does is it applies what are called colonial preferences. And the preference means that uh, while there will be a tariff on that timber coming in from the colonies, coming in from New Brunswick if you, if in this case, um, it will be lower than the tariff imposed for timber, say, coming from Sweden or from Germany. And what that means is that there's a preference given to the colonial product. It means that it should have a price advantage in the British market. 
And that makes sense because they're British colonies. You want to support the British colonies. We're going to see in a later lecture that this policy is going to come under attack from, uh, from, uh, from British politicians, particularly uh, industrial leaders in Britain, who view this as a kind of uh, tax on their own uh, production. It means, that, it means that it raises the value of, of uh, raises the cost of primary products coming into Great Britain, primary products that they then manufacture and sell to other people. So this, they view this as a tax on their uh, production. But of course, at the time, the British government is trying to kind of balance some of the colonial and uh, domestic interests of Great Britain at the time. But these three things mean that New Brunswick, certainly in the first half of the 19th century, has a significant advantage uh, in the British Empire timber trade. The result is um, substantial economic development. And the, the most obvious product of this is the city of St. John. In our time period, St. John is the fourth biggest city in British North America. It's a wealthy, prosperous city. We're having banks developed here. We're having mercantile firms develop here. We're seeing industries develop here. You can actually see this, uh, this is a, uh, a drawing from 1860, but you can see lots of church steeples. You can also see uh, steamships and factories being built. Uh, we're beginning to see some industrial employment here. We're seeing lots of money being made in St. John, and that money's being reinvested in other economies. But look at all those ships in the foreground. Those are ships carrying timber and made out of timber, increasingly, uh, from the New Brunswick market. And so you're seeing an economy develop there, a prosperity emerge on that basis. We'll, we'll come back to that point a little bit later. Let's switch quickly to Nova Scotia and say that in Nova Scotia, we also see another uh, staple uh, economy. We see agriculture. We see a timber trade in New Brunswick, in, sorry, in Nova Scotia as well. Um, but the largest economic sector uh, in Nova Scotia is the fishery. Uh, certainly in terms of exports from the province, in terms of products being exported. And of course, that's the, the province's main, any province's main source of income is money from other centers. Uh, that's the way they get cash into their economy, the way they get, they get gold and British pounds into their economy. So fish is really the most important uh, uh, economic sector uh, in Nova Scotia. And we've seen this before. We've, we looked at the fishery in Newfoundland, but you can see uh, those fishing banks again off the coast of Nova Scotia and of course there's also a coastal fishery, a small inshore fishery as we saw in Newfoundland as well. But still the fishery in general uh, is an important uh, economic activity in Nova Scotia. But again much of the industry is organized around exports. It's a product being shipped elsewhere for sale elsewhere. That's good because it brings in money but it also means that the kind of value that you can obtain from that fish uh, is reduced. Also a fishery in Prince Edward Island. Also a bit of a timber industry, though not much of one. PEI is very small and not heavily forested, uh, like other parts of the maritime colonies. Agriculture is by far the biggest industry uh, in Prince Edward Island. And those of you who know Prince Edward Island today, it's still the, by far the largest industry in PEI. In many ways, PEI is kind of one big farm. Um, but certainly in the 19th century, uh, trade and agricultural products is by far most important economic sector in Prince Edward Island. Agriculture in general is really important all across the maritime colonies and, and equally so in the Canadas as well. I'm just again today just focusing on the maritime colonies. Um, you can see this, uh, <laughs> this won't be on the exam I promise you, um, but you can see it's certainly um, significant areas, kind of a regional focus to the agricultural production. You can see PEI in particular, those, those are big circles there. Uh, and then you can see a couple of big s regional areas of big circles in, in Nova Scotia. You can see some in western Cape Breton along the north shore of Nova Scotia, then in the Annapolis Valley. That, that's that old Acadian region, that diked farmland area. And then the, the St. John River Valley uh, of New Brunswick, uh, that area going up the, from, the, from the southern coast up, through the, up along the western side there. Significant areas of agricultural production there, and then kind of big empty areas in the middle. Um, that points to a kind of regional focus even within the region. Uh, of agricultural production. But what's important to say is that while in terms of exports, the products that I was talking about before, timber and agriculture and the fishery and so on were, were more important, in terms of general economic value, agriculture is the most important because in the 19th century, three and four families are somehow linked to agriculture. They're somehow producing. They may not be, may not be their primary economic activity, uh, but for over half of them, it is their primary economic activity. So there's just a lot of value 
uh, being produced uh, on farms. A lot of that isn't being exported, so it doesn't show up in those export uh, tables. It's, it's being used locally or for the family itself, uh, but it's still economic value. It's still measurable in some sense, and that's what this graph is showing you, and particularly with the kinds of products that they're growing. You can see wheat, uh, uh, corn, uh, oats, buckwheat, uh, those kinds of standard uh, agricultural products. If we just break that down into kind of specialization for a second, you can see, and again, don't, don't worry about memorizing this thing. I just want to give you a kind of sense of this. If you look at these exports, you can see that um, Nova Scotia, by far the largest export is fish. Uh, you can see there's also significant agricultural exports, some manufacturing, um, but a a fishing is the largest. If you turn to New Brunswick, you can just look at the fishing column, and it collapses to 8%. So a significant difference between those two provinces in terms of the value of fish. What's the biggest product in New Brunswick? Well, we can see it's, it's wood by far, 40%. And look at compared to Nova Scotia, 12%. So again, you can see kind of um, that from a distance, they might look the same. Look up close at the particular economic activities, you can see they're really quite different. Then shifting to PEI, look, tiny uh, wood sector, uh, small fishing sector, Look at agriculture, 61% of the market. So that's, you know, that's a significant uh, difference. And again, you can see kind of a range of economic activities there. I want to make one final point about agriculture before I move on to the industrial economy. Uh, and this is a point about gender. And I think this is really, really important. This is domestic production. This is from the census of 1851. This is domestic production in Nova Scotia. And you can see it's three million, three million pounds of butter, 600,000 pounds of cheese, and so on, these, these different figures. Uh, and, and, I don't and again, don't memorize these figures. I want to make a general point here, not, not particular points about butter and cheese. Um, but you can see that these are significant economic products. Moreover, while a lot of these products are used in the household, a lot of them are sold on the market. Probably more than half of it sold on the market. That means there's cash coming into farm households from these products. What's really interesting is who makes these products. Can you think of who makes these products? It, it's women. Women make these products. This, women make butter. Women make cheese. Women are the ones responsible for making maple sugar. Women are the ones who weave uh, flannel and cloth in the households on those kinds of spinning wheels that you might have seen at pioneer settlements and those kinds of things. So a significant portion of the cash coming into farm households in the middle of the 19th century, in Nova Scotia at least, is coming directly from women's hands. And I think that's really, really important because we again, when we tend to think about kind of the pioneer family and we think about wheat farms and oat farms and cattle farms and whatever, we think about the farmer as a man. And farm households really require a lot of inputs, a lot of production, a lot of work, um, and a lot of the cash being uh, developed in those households is coming from female labor. Uh, in many cases, more than half of the income uh, of a farm household is coming from women's labor, not from men's labor. So women are making an enormous contribution. And I don't mean that in that kind of simple, you know, they're helping. No, they're central and critical to the financial success of these households, in many ways leading uh, the financial success of these households. That's, that's an important part, point for us to, to keep in mind. We're beginning to see a shift, and this is kind of the, the, the big picture look at this at this at this uh, of this lecture. Uh, and where we're moving to is where we're beginning to use those primary staple products to make other things. The most obvious example of this is shipbuilding. These are wooden ships. Look at those masts; those are big, big, tall trees. Um, but you're suddenly seeing the production of a very sophisticated product very valuable product out of those local primary products. And I say suddenly, they've been doing it since the 18th century, probably since this, probably in the French period, they were building ships as well, um, smaller ships, but building ships as well. But in the 19th century, this really begins to take off. And by the middle of the 19th century, uh, the New Brunswick shipping, shipbuilding industry in particular, but Nova Scotia as well, um, is a significant shipbuilding industry. By the middle of the 19th century, um, the British North American colonies represent the fifth largest merchant fleet in the world. That's an amazing turn. Now that's in terms of tonnage, that's in terms of the, the number of ships produced. And really what this represents is not, don't imagine a single large shipyard in St. John or Halifax building all these. This is dozens, literally dozens of small little shipbuilding facilities like this one you're seeing in Guysboro, Nova Scotia. Just along the shore of a river, they're building a ship. 
local labor, local investment, local skill, local knowledge, building literally dozens of ships every year. Not all of them this big, a lot of them are smaller, coastal vessels, schooners for the fishing industry and so on. But in aggregate, when you put it all together, they're building a lot of ships. And really that represents a fundamental shift in the economy. Increasingly, the staple product is being used for domestic consumption, to build something new for sale within the colony. Now, often these ships get sold in Great Britain, so again, there's part, it's part of the trade economy underway here. But again, they're using local skills, local talent, local labor. And this is not kind of poor farmers arriving from England with no other skills than to cut down a tree. This is skilled labor. These people have to know how to build a ship. Uh, so therefore, it's much more valuable labor. So you're seeing kind of a move towards a higher skilled, higher value uh, economic activity. So this is, again, a pattern you're seeing uh, in the 19th century. This is the Marco Polo. And, and this is just meant to kind of show you what we're really talking about here. This is built in St. John's, launched in 1851 in St. John, New Brunswick. Clipper ships are the biggest ships of the day. The Marco Polo is the largest and fastest clipper ship ever built. Um, it is a marvel of engineering technology. And it's built in, in New Brunswick in, in the 1850s. They, in the 1850s, represent the highest level of the most sophisticated marine craft available in the world. And they're producing it. They're selling it on a global market. So you're looking at rapid advancement to a very high level, very high skill level and value of production. You're also seeing this beginning to emerge uh, in other industries. Nova Scotia has large deposits of coal. It has significant deposits of iron. You're beginning to see, so from the 1820s on in Nova Scotia, you're beginning to see a significant coal mining industry. You're beginning to see iron foundries built. This is one uh, in Londonderry, Nova Scotia. And, and these are remarkable because again, we think of kind of large industrial facilities in places like, like Toronto, Montreal, or Hamilton. Uh, but in the 19th century, they're in places like Gananoque, Ontario. They're in places like Sydney and New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Or in this case, Londonderry, Nova Scotia. If you drove by Londonderry today, you'd miss it. It's on the highway. There ain't nothing there. Uh, trees. <laughs> if you walk into the forest, you can find archaeological uh, remnants of some of these factories. But that's all. But in the middle of the 19th century, this is some of the largest industrial production uh, in British North America. Uh, and it's, again, part of changing that economy, of taking a, a raw product and manufacturing it in the colony, turning it into something else. Look what's in the foreground of this picture. There's a small, um, very early uh, railway line there. Railway lines demand a lot of steel, demand a lot of iron. The railways themselves, the trains, the cars demand uh, metal products of all sorts. Again, you're looking at engineering. Again, you're looking at metal workers. Again, you're looking at higher skilled workers. The economy's changing. So we're also seeing a push to try to encourage this. And this is not really going to happen in our time period. This is really something that's going to happen more in your post-Confederation course than in your pre-Confederation course. But you're beginning to see a lot of these local manufacturers push for uh, the, the colonies initially and then eventually Canada uh, to put tariffs on products to begin to encourage those industries. A lot of early industrial um, production, like shoes, like textiles, like sugar, like brewing and distilling, um, they're very expensive to get going. They're relying on local products. They can draw local products. Think of brewing. Brewing's a great example of this. Beer. What do you make? What do you need for, to, for making beer? You, you need agricultural products. You need rye to make whiskey. You need malt to make beer. Uh, there's all kinds of agricultural products going into these things. Um, but they're expensive to get going. You need to build the factory. You need to have skilled labor. You need to have all these kinds of costs to bring together. A tariff is a way to help you along that road. And what we're looking at here are the colonies seeking tariffs. So for example, just a quick example of this, let's look at shoes. Um, they're making lots of um, shoes in, in Europe at this time, lots of shoes in Great Britain at this time, lots of shoes in England, uh, sorry, in the United States at this time. It means that most of the shoes people are buying uh, in British North America are coming from those places. There's some shoes being made, some skilled shoemakers uh, being, making them in British North America, but not on a particularly large scale. If they want to build up that scale, if they want to move up to an industrial scale of production, it's going to be expensive. And so a lot of them say, quite reasonably, because this is happening in Great Britain and the United States as well, 
we need a tariff on imports coming into our country. And what that is, the tariff is, is a tax. So just a quick example, the shoe then coming in from say Boston um, is going to have a tax added to it when it crosses the border. Say it's going to be 20%, just to, I'm just picking the number of the year, but say it's 20%. That means that suddenly that product is 20% more expensive. It has to be 20% more expensive because of the tax placed onto it. That gives the local manufacturer a kind of cushion. It means that their initial cost of production might be really quite high, but this gives them a chance to catch up. And it gives them a chance to invest, to develop the product, develop the skills, develop the workplaces uh, to get that product onto the market and to compete successfully uh, in the market. Again, this will have tremendous changes across, uh, across all of Canada uh, in the time period. But we're seeing these small manufacturers pushing this kind of idea. In New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, you'll see some particular tariffs placed in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s uh, on particular products. Uh, but then when the Canadian government is created after Confederation, you'll see a broader approach to this. And in the 1870s and 1880s, you'll see a significant move towards tariffs. In many ways, this is regarded uh, as the, kind of the beginning of Canadian industrial, not the beginning, but the, the consolidation of Canadian industrialization. But here's its beginning. Here's where it's kind of coming out in small manufacturers in places like, as I suggest here, Halifax and New Glasgow and St. John, relatively small places in the global economy, uh, but relatively big places within these colonies, looking for ways to improve their place in that economic world.